like to say hello to everyone and welcome to the ICG at Owensboro. Our prayers are especially with Martin Zeiss today. Uh, Martin's going to speak at the funeral. As far as I know, going to do part of the eulogy. And uh, we'll always remember Donna. Uh, and we'll see her soon, Martin. So hang in there, be tough. Our prayers are with you. And uh, you are part of us. Uh, also, hello to Louise Barr. I uh, hope Louise is doing fine. Our prayers are with Louise and all of our fellow ministers, our deacons, and brethren everywhere. It sure is good to see you. I'm going to do just a couple of readings, and I'm going to turn it over to Chris for the first message. Psalm 18 is one I always like to go to in times of stress, need, times of help when we need help. Uh, Psalm 18 says here, I will love thee, O Lord, my strength. And that's where we find it at. It's in the Lord. It goes on to say, the Lord is my rock. To everyone's name that I mentioned today, always remember that. The Lord is a rock of our salvation. Turn to Him in times of sorrow. Turn to His word. Turn to His direction. And He will give you comfort. He will give you comfort and peace. He's our fortress, our deliverer. He's our strength. And always remember that. And whom I will trust, our buckler, the horn of our salvation. He's our high tower. And I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised. Amen to that, right, brother? Amen to that, to everyone here. I shall be saved from my enemies. One enemy that we will be saved from eventually will be death. You'll have the victory over death. It's good to know, isn't it? Especially for our loved ones, someone that we care about deeply. So yes, Martin, everyone here, you will see your loved ones again and be with them. That's a great, great promise. Great promise. The sorrows of death compass me. The floods of ungodly men make me afraid. The sorrows of hell compassed about me. The snares of death prevented me. But in my distress, I called upon the Lord and cried out to my God. What God? The God of this book. The real God. God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, not the God of this world, whom we'll talk about, about a little bit later. And he heard our voice. And his, our cry came before his ears. It came before him, even to our ears. It says, in the earth shook and it trembled. The foundations also of the hills moved and were shaken and were shaken. Then it says in 17, he delivered me from my strong enemy and from them which hated me. All of us can relate to that, can't we? We can. The enemy of I'm thinking of today is death and sorrow and war and hatred. Very, very important. Then in 20 it says, The Lord rewarded me according to my righteousness, according to the cleanliness of my hands as he recompensed me. I have kept the ways of the Lord. So all of God's first fruits that hear my voice. Honor God. Keep his laws and commandments. Pray daily. Stay close to the Almighty God, the true God, and Jesus Christ of this book. You and I will never fail. Eternal life awaits. Eternal life. Yes, we may have sadness in our hearts today, but one day there will be happiness for everyone. And what a great reunion that will be. A great reunion. His judgments were before me, before us, but I did not put away his statutes for me. That's important. Keep them. Love his laws and commandments. It's the greatest, the best journey we've ever been on, brother the greatest and the best and the most important and the most important church. So our prayers are with Martin today, Louise, and everyone that needs the mercy of God and his words are true. His words are very true and they're very powerful. So now for our first message will be our deacon, Mr. Chris Anderson. Well, it's good to be together again. 
good to be here on film day again. And the message I have today is titled, Why Christ Must Return. The world has always taught that he's going to return. They have many different theories. Uh, the, the Church of God, of course, we go by the truth in the Bible of how this will happen. But sometimes we lose focus on why he has to return. And that's what I want to speak of today. Because the people, they're actually tired of hearing it. Uh, Peter said there would be scoffers in, well, yeah, scoffers in the last day. And there is. People don't think he's coming. They kind of give up on it. And there's one reason is there's not a lot of meat given to this doctrine. And when we as God's uh, church, the first fruit, and we look upon the world, it's in a very chaotic state. We can see these things. Uh, when we turn the news on, we just don't see stuff as, oh, that's a news story. What are we going to do about it? We actually look at it and say, what are we going to do about it? But how is this fitting into Bible prophecy? How is this affecting the modern day nations of Israel? And is this coming a time when punishment is drawing closer for the sins? Now, there's several reasons why Jesus Christ has to return. And by no means, as the old cliche says, can we even scratch the surface today. But I want you to turn to Matthew 24. And we're going to begin at verse 4. One of the reasons he has to return, Matthew 24, and beginning at verse 4. And Jesus answered them, See that no one leads you astray. Well, what's he talking about? Well, there's several that would take off and, and start giving opinions, but let's keep reading. It says, For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and would lead many astray. Now, some people believe that that's something like David Koresh was. He claimed to be Jesus Christ, and he had this little bitty following. That, that's not what Christ is talking about. He's talking about major religions that say they have Christ but they don't want to actually do what he says they want their own doctrine now I don't mean that to be offensive by any means but when we look how many denominations in the Christian faith are there in the US well there's 35 major denominations now that's not counting the thousands of splinters that have branched off and you have know, gone independent and this and that and you know even God's church we've had this splinter issue through the years ourselves. Now what what makes a difference in in teaching? Well there's one, one way you teach tradition and another way you teach biblical truth. And Christ warned us that false religion would deceive the nations. He told us not to be deceived. And, and he isn't talking about, like I said, the worshiping of trees or stones or these ancient things you think about in, in biblical days. No, he's talking about something that puts his name on it. And you could refer back to my last sermon, the one we recorded last month of Are You Teaching the Truth? And it, will, it de deals with a lot of these issues. In Revelation chapter 6, You've always heard of the four horsemen of the apocalypse, and, and it's, it is a direct parallel to Matthew 24. And we read, and it says in verse 1, chapter 6 and verse 1, I watched when the Lamb opened one of the seven seals and heard one of the four living creatures say with a voice of thunder, Come. And I looked, and behold, a white horse. Now some people want to teach this is Jesus Christ. It is not Jesus Christ because it would not fit the timeline. It's a direct parallel in Matthew 24. He hasn't returned, nor is he actually on his way at this point. What he says, and a rider had a bow and a crown was given to him and he came out conquering and to conquer. That is actually a false religious system that would deceive the world. How can we fix the problems with confusion in churches? You know, people honestly believe what they believe. You know, I believe what I read and others read and they believe what they read. What is the fix to it for all of us? Well, Christ has to return 
and we will read this in Isaiah chapter 2. Uh, many churches teach the Old Testament. It's irrelevant nowadays. That's completely false. And it says in chapter 2 and verse 1, the word that came to Isaiah the son of Amos saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. It shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established as the highest of the mountains. And it shall be lifted above the hills and all nations shall flow to it. And many people shall come and say, Come, let us go to the mountain of the eternal, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways, and that we may walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go the law, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Has this happened yet? Of course it hasn't. The world's in chaos. This is speaking of a time when there's peace and people are open to hearing the truth of God from myself to everybody else will in that day understand clearly the truth of God's Word. Another reason He has to return. And this is a big one for so many and we... We continue reading in Matthew 24 at verse 6. It says, You will hear of, rumors, hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not alarmed, for this must take place, but the end is not yet. Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And there will be famines and earthquakes in various places. The world has never known peace. Mike spoke of this in a sermon or two ago where he actually gave how many years it was and it was a bare minimum of recorded history that there's been peace on this earth. And actually it's going to get worse as we draw closer to the end of this age. We're going to see war like we've never seen war. The only way, the only way to have world peace is the return of Jesus Christ. And to read you the parallel in verse three, uh, chapter 6 and verse 3 of Revelation. He opened the second seal and I heard the second living creature say, Come, and out came another horse bright red. Its rider was permitted to take peace from the earth so that people should slay one another and he was given a great sword. I tried to look up the number of deaths that have occurred due to war. It's impossible impossible to sit here and read them to you. If I did, it would probably take me 30 minutes to read you what history has recorded between civilian and soldier deaths all related to war. It's too massive to list. Uh, but I would encourage you to Google it. It's, it's mind-blowing. And can a president, can a dictator, can a senator, can anyone else stop war? No, they can't. They can't do it. We're, we're on the brink of it right now. The world's feeling like it's about to blow up. We'll have to wait and see. Stuff tends to speed up. Stuff tends to slow down. We'll have to wait and see what it does. But again, I ask this question, and I already answered it, but what will fix the problem? Isaiah chapter 2 again. Verse 4. Isaiah 2 and verse 4. He shall judge between the nations, and he shall decide disputes for many peoples. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares, and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. Why must Jesus Christ return? He has to return to end confusion. He has to return to end war. And with all war... What follows war? Famine, disease. And what did we read in Matthew 24 just a moment ago? That there would be famine and disease and earthquakes in various places. When we read in Revelation, the sixth chapter still in verse 5, when he opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, Come, and I looked, and behold, a black horse. Its rider had a pair of scales in his hand, and I heard what seemed to be a voice in the midst of the four creatures saying, A quart of wine, a quart of wheat for a denarius, and three quarts of barley for a denarius, and do no harm to the oil and wine. 
And I looked, and behold, a pale horse, and its rider's name was Death and Hades, and Hades followed with him. And they were given authority over a fourth of the earth to kill with the sword and famine and pestilence and by wild beasts of the earth. All of this is going to come upon this planet. But what we currently have, this is from the Center of Disease Control. Just in case someone would think I was pulling this from a far right leaning website or something. This is government stats from 2014. It's the newest data sheet they had out. Leading causes of death. Heart disease was number one. 614,348 people in the U.S. alone. Cancer came in at number two, 591,699. The list goes on and on and on to the hundreds to the 40,000s of on this list. There's only one fix to this, folks, and that's the return of Jesus Christ. He has to return to end all sickness, and He has to return to end death. We find it in Revelation, the 21st chapter, verse 4. One of the most popular verses we hear. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there will be no, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, or crying, or pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. He has to return to do away with this. There's not a one of us in here or whose my voice will reach their ears that has not had to bury a loved one. Thank God when we have this hope and this truth that one day that will be eliminated. He has to come back. Another issue, and this one has kind of become important to me. It's not one you hear about a whole lot, but it's plagued us for years and years and years. Politicians. We're going to have to see the day when there are no more politicians. 1 Samuel chapter 8, beginning at verse 1. Let's see a little bit about the first politician that we read about. 1 Samuel 8, beginning at verse 1. When Samuel became old, he made his sons judges over Israel because at the time Israel had judges, but God himself was king over his nation, over his people. He said the firstborn was Joel, and the, second, and the name of his second was Ab Abiah, and they were judges in Beersheba. Yet his sons did not walk in, in his ways and turned aside after gain. Boy, does that not sound familiar. It was happening way back then. You could buy their pockets, as the old saying goes. <clears throat> they took bribes and perverted justice. David in here says a lot. He quotes Ecclesiastes. There's nothing new under the sun, is it? There's nothing new. And all the elders gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah and said to him, Behold, you are old, and your sons do not walk in your ways. So instead of getting rid of them, they decide they want a king. It says, Appoint us a king to judge us like all the nations. They wanted to be like all of these Gentile nations around them and have this strong leader looking over them. And it displeased Samuel, and he said, Give us a king. When they said, Give us a king to judge us, and Samuel prayed to the Lord. And the Lord said to Samuel, and I want you to listen to this very closely Obey the voice of the people and all they say to you, for they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me from being king over them. Let's read that one more time. They, the people, have rejected me. God speaking from being a king over them. According to all the deeds they have done for the day I brought them up out of Egypt, even to this day forsaking me and serving other gods, so they are also doing to you. It's still seeking other gods, even knowing that some of them are blind to that truth. Such as this Easter that just passed, the celebration of fertility. 
What does little bunnies and eggs have to do with the resurrection of Jesus Christ? Absolutely nothing. Yet millions went out there and partook of it, and none of them asked why they do it. I challenge you to look it up and prove me wrong that that has anything to do with Jesus Christ. I believe you're going to find that it has a lot to do with a pagan goddess and fertility rites. People have always done this ever since he led them out of Egypt. He just said it. He says in verse 9, Now then obey their voice. Only you shall solemnly warn them and show them the ways of the king who will reign over them. So Samuel told all of the words to the eternal to the people who were asking for a king. And he said, These will be the ways of the king who will reign over you. He will take your sons and appoint them to his chariots to be his horsemen and to run before his chariots. He will appoint for himself commanders of thousands and commanders of fifty, some to plow his ground and to reap his harvest and to make his implements of war and the equip equipment of his chariots. Your daughters shall be perfumers and cooks and bakers. He will take the best of your fields and vineyards and olive orchards and give them to his servants. Listen to this one. He will take a tenth of your grain of your vineyards. Well, we don't use that system anymore, but we sure do see it coming out of our checks, don't we? Every week, there it goes. For stuff we don't want to pay for. We don't care to do what's patriotic and, you know, preserve our military and constitutional, you know, government. But what they spend it on now, it's ridiculous. Absolutely ridiculous. It says he will, he will uh, in verse 17, will take a tenth of your flocks and listen to this, and you shall be his slaves. How true is that? How true is it? You know, when this nation was formed, it was formed on freedom. The ability to own property. We don't own property anymore. If you don't believe me, don't pay your property taxes. Watch and see yourself get evicted. The government owns your land. You just have a deed that says you do. And it all started right here. We're reading where it started. It started all the way back in Samuel's days. And in verse 19, no, verse 18. We just kind of went through this, didn't we? Listen to this. And in that day you will cry out because of your king, whom you, you have chosen for yourselves. But the Lord will not answer you in that day. We just saw one, in my opinion, one of the worst administrations we've ever seen. And that ain't saying any of them's been righteous. I'm not saying that whatsoever. And it says in verse 19, the people refused to obey the voice of Samuel and they said, no, but there be a king over us. And that we may also be like the nations and our king may judge us and go out before us and fight our battles. And Samuel had heard all the words of the people and he repeated it to them again in the ears of the, he repeated them again to the ears of the Lord. And the Lord said to Samuel, Obey their voice and make them a king. So Samuel said to the men of Israel, Go every man into his own city. And we, without continuing reading, but we find that they chose Saul. Saul became their king. And how long did it take Saul to become corrupted? Not long. 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 10. The word of the Eternal came to Samuel, I regret that I have made Saul king, for he has turned his back from following me and has not performed my commandments. And folks, we've never had a leader that wanted to observe the commandments. We've never had one, ever, not since our founding. They have never wanted to observe God's Sabbath or keep His holy days. They would rather keep these 
pagan or origin holidays. People have always wanted to look to a man for salvation. God was king over Israel and judges was appointed to handle the laws and such. You know, we who are baptized in God's church should not fall into this trap. Man cannot save this country or any other country on the planet. He can't do it and a woman can't do it either. We cannot look to them for salvation. No politician, none of them, can save this country or any other. You know, it's good at times a politician can renew our patriotism. You know, a lot of people are feeling that right now. But patriotism does not equate to godliness. They're not the same thing. We all love this great land. We love it. We would love to see it great. We really would. But that does not equate to commandment keeping, to doing what Jesus Christ asked us to do. Following God's laws and His precepts show God our dedication, not our dedication to a president or a senator or a representative or governor or the list goes on. Christ has to return to save us from politicians and from ourselves. Our King, the one we're waiting for, the one the first fruits are supposed to be looking for, the kingdom we're supposed to be looking for. We read about in Revelation 19 and 16, speaking of Jesus Christ, on his robe and on his thigh he has a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. That's our king. As much as there's things I like Donald Trump does, there's a whole lot of things I don't like that he does. But let me tell you what, when this king returns, it's all going to be perfection. And his law will reign supreme. That's the kingdom we're waiting for. Not one that some politician claims they can save. If you want this nation to turn around, number one is we have to get the eye out of it. We have to start looking again to our Creator. And in 2 Chronicles 7, 14, oh, one of the most popular verses in the whole Bible, if my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and forgive their sin and heal their land. Celebrating paganism is not going to cut it. If you want to truly make this nation great again, we have to seek the true Creator God and observe His ways. Now I'll leave you with this thought. Can things be better? Is the kingdom of God better than what a man or a woman can create? Do you want to see the end of sickness? You know, I do. This past month we took Kristen down to Vanderbilt for her neurologist checkup for her migraines and the room was full and I looked and I saw all these little kids in there all of them sitting there sick one crying because his head was hurting so bad and he, he was so little he didn't know what to do he didn't know why he was hurting I looked and I saw this one little one who had this deformity but she was up playing with blocks just like all of the others I want to see a day when those kids aren't hurting when that little girl's completely normal running in the fields free, free from all sickness. That's what I want to see. I want to see them make it to their teenage years. Some of them young ones I saw may not. I look for the day when the, when the little children have a chance to grow up and they're not murdered before they come out of the womb. And I don't care who that ticks off. It's not a right. It's murder and it's a sin. Abortion is a sin. Not a right. That's the silliest thing that's ever been taught in this country. I mentioned a while ago to you the number one leading cause of death was heart disease. No, it's not. The newest stats on abortion from the Center of Disease Control was 2013. I told you the number of heart disease was 614,348. The number of legal abortions 
was 664,435. We killed more than died naturally. Why do I want to see Christ return? To end that. I desire a kingdom when I don't have to bury my loved ones anymore. I desire a kingdom when there is no more pain and no sickness, no death, no suffering. There's no more jealousy. There's no more corrupt politicians. There's no more liars. There's no one talking bad about somebody. There's no more war. There's no more deceit. And Satan the devil is gone and he's not running things anymore. Think of the world around us, folks. It, it's in terrible shape. Even if the economy rebounded and all of this and you felt good about your country, and there's nothing wrong with that, but all of these troubles would still be here. You would still have abortion. You would still have corrupt politicians. And the world would still be suffering from starvation, from disease, from homelessness. No matter how good it could be economically, we have to desire and pray daily as He told us in the model prayer, Thy kingdom come. Why does He have to return? I just give you the, a few short reasons. He's our only hope for a better life. He is our only hope for security. He's our only hope for salvation. He is the only hope for every man, woman, and child. He is our only hope for peace, and He's our only hope for eternal life, and our only hope to grab our loved ones again and hug them by the neck and watch them learn the truth of God and be born into that family. That's the kingdom I want to go to. That's the kingdom I want to be a part of. And Jesus Christ and God the Father are my creators and they're the ones I want to serve. Dear Jesus, please return and save us from this land. Now our minister, Mike Parker. Thank you, Chris. Wonderful job. Great words. Great words. Amen. Brother, the habitats, the customs, and the beliefs of this world are contrary to the commandments and holy days found in this book. The servants of God down through the ages have cried out to nations and to people against their sins and their crimes against the Word of God. They've cried out to Him and begged for, that they would, they would fight Him they would change. Selfishness, vanity, lust, hate and war permeates this little blue marble that we live on, this little blue planet. For right now, this is not God's world. It belongs to Satan. But there is a time coming when a new king, a new sheriff will arrive. Revelation 19. Revelation 19. I'm going to read you this. Revelation 19, verse 11. And I saw heaven open up, and him that sat on it was on a white horse. He was called faithful and true. He judges and he makes war. His eyes were a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. And, his clo and he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood. And his name is called the Word of God. Jesus Christ is coming back soon. And to all the first fruits who have been called at this time, endure to the end and listen to these words. And this is this is for me also. It'd be First Thessalonians. Okay? And I read this a lot. First Thessalonians 5. First Thessalonians 5. I'm just going to read a few of them. It starts off and it says, it tells us not to sleep if we have been called by God. It tells us to watch and be sober. And it tells us to comfort each other and to edify each other. 
tells us to build each other up to God's first fruits, all that are in the church. It says comfort the feeble-minded. Something we should do. People that need our help. Help the weak. In 14, be patient towards all men. Do God's first fruits. Do not render evil for evil, but follow that which is good. It says rejoice evermore, and this is important. Pray without ceasing. That's how you stay close to God. That's how you stay close. What's it say then? Everything give thanks. Everything give thanks. Quench not the spirit. When you come out of the waters of baptism and you come up and you receive God's spirit, do these things. Pray, rejoice, and let it grow within you. It will overtake. It will permeate your whole body. Just like sin permeates this whole little blue marble that we live on. God's spirit will help you fight this sin of the world. And you need him. Can't do it alone. Cannot do it alone. It says, prove all things, hold fast that which is good, and the very God of peace in 23 will sanctify you wholly. And he talks about you will be preserved blameless. And we should pray that for each and every one of us until the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. There's only one way to repent. Repent means real change. How do you do that? You go under the refreshing waters of baptism and you come up. You come up, a new creature in Christ. You don't get it all at once. It starts out very small. And it grows with you and through you over a period of years. And you add a little bit each, each day, each day. Then you must change and keep the true Sabbath and the holy days. Yes, Chris, that's right. Not the Anglo-Saxon God of reproduction and fertility. And not little Easter rabbits and bunnies with eggs that our children hunt. No, but we learn about the Passover and the real sacrifice of Jesus Christ. That was great, Chris. We must follow the commandments of Almighty God and His Son. As a New Testament church was being formed, Peter set forth the way to salvation, and that is Acts 2. It's right here, brethren, Acts 2. Listen to what Peter said, Acts 2, verse 38. He says, repent means real change. Be baptized, every one of you, in the name of the real Jesus Christ. Laws and commandments found in here. What he taught. For the remission of sins. And you will receive, and this is what I'll talk about in a little bit, you will receive the Holy Spirit, which is important. The only way, part of his mind, to fight sin. To fight sin. Romans 2.13, I'll just paraphrase it. Not hearers of the law are justified, but doers, doer the, do, doers of the law are justified. How do we fight the sins that we are surrounded by in this world? Staying close to God and having His Spirit. That will also help us to grow in grace and knowledge. There's only one way. Letting God's Spirit enter in that great powerful breath wind life that we can't see but we know something has happened to us we receive it after baptism what is it that's what I will talk about today what is it after baptism we are given a small seed God's Holy Spirit if allowed to grow and develop it will permeate every part of our life. It's the most important force and the most powerful force that can be given to mankind. And God's called out once his first fruits. It's transforming, it's changing. And what can the Hebrew translation say about the word spirit and its various roots? It's breath, it's air, and they're not like these. It's strength, 
It's courage. I like that one. It's powerful. It's invisible. And there is a direct relationship between God's Holy Spirit and power. This is what the Greek says about power. Strength, miraculous, mighty, very important. When you're first, a little side note here, when you're first called into God's church, you start out as a, as a little babe in Christ. Boy, if you hang with it, God will make you courageous to stand up for Him. He will make you a fighter. How do you do it? Not by yourself. But it's what He puts inside of you to give you strength. It's something we can't see. Just like the apostles were influenced by it, we have been influenced by it. John 14. Let's go there. John 14. John 14. We'll start in verse 15. A little description here. Let's do a little lead up. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. If you love me, keep my commandments. John 14, verse 16. And I will pray the Father, and he will give you a comforter that may, it may abide with you forever. It's the spirit of truth in 17, which the world cannot receive because it sees him not. Brother, if you have questions and you think that you're not being told the truth and you hear my voice, God may be calling you. He may be calling. If he is calling, make that decision to go under the waters of baptism and make that decision to deal with real change in your life and not go back to this world. I think that's something all of us in here had to deal with. I did. I had to deal with it. The world is an ugly place. It's an ugly place out there. Then he says, I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. And that's very important. Then in 26, it says the Spirit which is the Holy Ghost, or the Comforter, which is the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name. He shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance. And then he talks about this great peace. Where does that come from? Knowing what lies ahead. Eternal life. And like Chris was saying, knowing that one day all this, man's rule will no longer exist. The government of God will be here. And it says, let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Because the Spirit tells us that all these things must come to pass. They all must. John 20. I thought this was really interesting. John 20, verse 19. John 20, verse 19. Jesus was speaking to his apostles. John 20, verse 19. Then the same day at even, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, came Jesus, and he stood in the midst of them. And he said, Peace be unto you. And when he had so said, he showed them his hands. The disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. They knew who he was, didn't they? Then said Jesus to them, Peace be unto you, as my Father has sent me, even so I send you. Read on. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said unto them, Receive you the Holy Spirit. Isn't that interesting? He breathed on him. Remember what it says. Wind, breath, strength, courage. Something you can't see, but the apostles knew something happened to them. Something we can't see in this room today. But we know something has happened to us, and that's why we're here. Why aren't we at the Little Baptist Church down on 4th Avenue, brother? Because God, God had a different plan for us. A different plan. This power starts out as a small seed. A little small seed. And I like to compare it to a mustard seed. You can hold a hundred of them in the palm of your hand. Like a mustard seed. It starts out small. But if it remains and it grows for the glory of God, it will provide shade for many 
and grow into a beautiful tree, eight and ten foot tall. Eight and ten foot. The tiniest of all seeds, but grown in beauty and great power, just like God's Holy Spirit. Just like God's Spirit. This Spirit will help us to deliver or develop not a shameful attitude, but one of strength and glory to God, and one not of fear. It'll help us to give strength, courage, and devotion like no other devotion to anything else. A devotion to this word because your eyes are opened up and you see clearly. You see clearly through His Spirit. When talking about God's Spirit, we must read Acts 2, 1 through 4, and Romans 8, 2 through 18. So let's go to Acts 2. I'm going to tell you what it is. Acts 2, on the day of Pentecost, Acts 2, 1 through 4. Listen to this. And when the day of Pentecost was fully, fully come, they are in one accord, in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind. Remember the meaning of spirit. And it filled the house where they were all sitting. And appeared unto them cloven tongues like a fire. And it set upon each of them. And they were filled with the Holy Spirit. And began to speak with tongues, which is nothing more than languages. All these people that were there, the Medes, the Cretes, the Persians, they all heard these apostles speak in their own language, which is phenomenal. In their own language. As the Spirit gave them utterance. As the Spirit gave them utterance. Remember Peter. He denied Christ three times. Three times. But then, his devotion and the Spirit that he was given overcame his past, just like it's overcame us. Overcame his past. And he'd done great miracles, didn't he? Great miracles of speaking. Great miracles of healing. He healed the lame man, didn't he? He told him to get up, rise, and walk, didn't he? Yes, he did. And the people looked upon him as God. But he said, whoa, I'm not the God. I have no power. It's by the power of Jesus Christ and Almighty God that this man walked, is what he said. He gave the credit to where, where it belonged. He gave it, gave it to God and Jesus Christ. I say once again, remember the meanings of the word spirit, courage, power, miraculous, strength. Strength. Romans 8. Let's go there. Okay? Romans 8. It says a lot. Romans 8, verse 2. For the law of the Spirit of life for Christ, in Christ Jesus had made me free from the law of sin and death. And it talks about in 4. That the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Once you are given God's Spirit, I said your eyes are open. Yes, they are. They are open to what's important. Not fleshly ideas. Commandments of God and service to God. Walking after the Spirit. Creating good fruits of love and kindness and patience. Developing a godly attitude to be used in God's kingdom someday. And that's what we're working for. And brother, if you hear my voice, you can too. You can be working for that. For they that are after the flesh, they do mind things of the flesh. God's Spirit will help you put on the brakes of fleshly desires and things. It will lead you in a different direction of what's really important. That a great creator has called you to do his will. To do his will. Not the will of the world. Not the will of the world. But they that are after the Spirit, they do things in the Spirit. Carly minded is death. To be carly minded is death. Spiritually minded is what? Life and peace in it. Absolutely. We, th we see things differently. We know what's on the horizon. 
The carnal mind is against God. It's not subject to the law. They that are in the flesh cannot please the Almighty. But his first fruits are not in the flesh. But that's a warning too. I've known many ministers that have went back and drove away the Spirit of God through self-righteousness. They drove it away. And now it's just a little flicker of a flame burning. Stay close to God in prayer. And God will remain with you. And He will drive Satan away. If you've got a problem, get on your knees. And that problem, God will help you with. He says it will flee from you. All problem is caused by Satan. And it goes on to say, but you are not in the flesh, God's people. It's called out ones, but in the spirit, ones that have come out of the waters of baptism. If, if so be that the spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is not of his. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. And 11 is important. Chapter 8, verse 11. But if the spirit of him that raised up Christ from the dead dwells in you, he that raised Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by the spirit that dwells in you. This is a little deep, a little off the subject for a moment, but God's first fruits will gain a thousand years on the rest of the world. God's first fruits, his called out ones, will gain a thousand years. Would you not want to see your loved ones a thousand years sooner than you might otherwise? Absolutely. Repent. Change. Go into the waters of baptism and receive the great power of Jesus Christ. Receive His Spirit the help that will help you conquer if you become devoted and committed. It will help you. Yes, the Spirit is power. And something the church hasn't done enough of is pray for healings. The Spirit is power. Through the Spirit, if God sees that you're sincere and believe, He will do healings for you if you ask. Not all the time. Not all the time. But we just have to take it when He gives us and give Him glory and praise. This unseen power is real. It will warn us. It will change us. It will help us to convince. It will edify us. It will strengthen. And just as I mentioned a minute ago, yes, it can even heal. The Holy Spirit is the presence of God's power working in the church and the ministry. In the ministry. Listen to the writings of Paul. Go with me to 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. I read this a lot here, but I'm really, I'm really stunned by it. I guess it really kind of, this is the category that I fit into. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 1 through 5. I'm sorry, pick it up. Go over just one page. Chapter 1. Chapter 1. I love to read this. Chapter 1, verse 26. Chapter 1 of 1 Corinthians. You're calling, brethren, not many wise after the flesh and not many mighty. Not many noble are called. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And He's chosen the weak things, brethren, the weak things to confound the things which are mighty. Why no flesh should glory in His presence? In 29. But what's it say? Just like Peter and John, when they healed the lame man, they gave credit where it belonged. They gloried in the Lord. They gloried in Him in 31. As it is written, He that glory, let him glory in the Lord. And that should be our life. That should be us. The Holy Spirit is a direct hotline to the throne of God. Got a problem? You are His children. You are His children. Pray to Him. 
Ask him to come to you and help you. <clears throat> Remember, God's Spirit has made us strong. God's Spirit helps us to stand up in times of stress for the real truth. We were once babes in Christ. Now we are being fed with the meat, the meat of the Word. Now we can feed other people with the meat of the Word when we are called upon. How do we keep this strength, this spirit, this courage? James 4. Let's go there. James 4. James 4. Verse 7. 6 is interesting. It tells you what kind of heart God is looking for. God resists the proud but gives grace unto the humble in 6. James 4. Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist Satan and he will flee from you. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Draw near to God, brethren. If you hear my voice, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts. Be afflicted and mourn. Humble yourselves in ten. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift you up. God knows our heart. He knows our heart and what, and what we really stand for. And he will bring our works. He will bring our works into the open. If it be good or if it be bad. Then it talks about in 12. There is one lawgiver who is able to save and to destroy. There's one lawgiver. That's who you want to fear. Because he can kill both the physical body and the soul of the spirit. He can kill everything till we will exist no more. So once you are called of God to become his first fruits, it's a lifetime agreement. It's forever. Because you now belong to him. Don't belong to yourself, brother. You belong to him. Draw near to God, and He will draw near to you. Ephesians 6, I miss, I want to go back to this one. Ephesians 6. Okay? Ephesians 6. I'm not going to read it all because everyone knows who we battled. But I'll just pick up a few, few verses here. Ephesians 6 12. We wrestle not against flesh and blood but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness, spiritual wickedness in high places. Yes, God is not yet, or Jesus Christ is not yet the God of this world, but he will be soon. Just like Chris was saying, he will be soon. He's coming back. You can read this book and it's easy to find. The ruler of this world now is Satan. He's Satan, the devil. O oh, Israel, O oh, United States of America, why must you die? Because of lack of knowledge and direction and guidance. And not wanting real change. Not being told what to do. Not wanting to be told what to do. That's why. Who is behind the terrible stat about abortion and what Chris brought up to us? Terrible stat. Who else could be behind the murder of the unborn? They don't even have a chance to fight or live. As God's first fruits, that is the one that tears your heart out the most. It's that one. The murder of the unborn. We have been given the greatest gift ever given, and you can be given the greatest gift ever given to mankind, God's Holy Spirit. Your eyes will be opened. You will see very clearly. You will have power to complete your work, to complete God's work if he calls upon you. You will have power to develop the good fruits, the godly fruits of love and patience and kindness that the world does not have. But with him inside of you, you can. You can. Okay? We've read this many times. I'm just going to read the first of it. 
1 Corinthians chapter 13. This is important. You know, though I speak with the tongues of men and angels and have not love, does the world have love today? No, it does not. Are the churches, and I ask everyone out there, is your church doing the right thing? Are they doing any good? Are they creating an atmosphere of love and kindness towards each other? Are they having an impact? If you do not have this charity, this love, doesn't matter what I know or what you know or how well I can speak or tell you about the future and prophecy, it doesn't matter. It says it becomes as a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. And I've been in church before where those sounds have been made. I've been in church before where the smoke rolls out and where you do repeated praying over and over again, repeated, repeated prayers over and over again. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and knowledge, and though I have all faith, move mountains, if you do not have love, it says you it doesn't mean anything, you are nothing. How do you get this love, this understanding? God's spirit. God's spirit in his mind. When he was on the earth, Jesus Christ, his son, he healed the sick and raised the dead. And what did they do? Jealousy entered in and they killed him. That's a mind of, and he didn't, he could call down legions and legions of angels, it said, but he didn't. He didn't. He became our atonement, our sacrifice for sin. We just went through the Passover and unleavened bread. We read about his tremendous sacrifice. Has it got anything to do with a six-foot bunny rabbit, brother? Look it up like Chris was saying. Not a thing. By his blood are we healed. By his blood. Love. Read that love chapter. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Read that. The greatest of these is love, it says. He gave his life for us. I'll close with this one. Close with this one. Joshua. Joshua 1.9, okay? Joshua 1.9. And he tells us, he commands us, be strong of good courage, be not afraid, do not be dismayed, for the Lord thy God is with you wherever you go. And once you receive his mind, you know that to be so absolutely true, because things will happen in your life that are sometimes unexplainable either saving your life, getting you some work or a job, or working out a terrible problem in your life, you'll know that God is with you. He will always do his part, and we must do ours. Grow in the spirit and become mature. Get prepared for the latter days, brother. They are upon us. They are upon us. Repent deal with real change in your life and receive God's Holy Spirit that will help you overcome I beg of you all to hear God's true word hear God's true word God bless you all till we meet again